All right, uh, I want to begin by thanking Alex for all the help he gave us in uh, setting up the article that's in the uh, summer newsletter. I, we urge you to please go read that. There are a ton of footnotes in there. The footnotes are essential to truly understand this topic. Okay, well actually it's a dual topic. The first part is going to be given by uh, uh, Jan and uh, it's on the subject of whether or not Shakespeare was influenced by Commedia dell'arte or by Commedia erudita. Now, it may be he was influenced by both, but I'll leave that up to your decision. Then we're going to, to discuss a, uh, shall we call it a vignette, that uh, is an example of Commedia erudita. And we like to think of Commedia erudita as palace comedy. Okay? Yes, and of course, as an appreciation to Robert de Tobel, we've put up this. Two days before he died, I went to Frankfurt and saw Robert uh, uh, on uh, life-sustaining apparatus uh, in hospital. Uh, and Elke Brockman, uh, who is a close friend and took care of him, was there, and she was reading, uh, like it was mentioned yesterday by Wally Hurst, uh, Shakespeare to him. He, ha, louder, I'm sorry, uh, Robert de Tobel, who was there? Yes, um, again, apparently uh, much closer. Um, and when I told him uh, that I was there, he sort of made a gesture that he'd heard me, but I don't know, and it's probably something that you want to hear, but uh, I also regret uh, his loss, of course. Now, in Great Oxford, in chapter 14, Shakespeare in the Italian Colony, a comedy, sorry, by Kevin Gilvary, and I hope he doesn't mind that I cite him. Um, he says, Commedia dell'arte, whose characteristic improvisation by its very nature means that we cannot recover text of actual performances. So, if text were unrecoverable, why is it that Stratfordians and other scholars have been so adamant about Shakespeare's use of dell'arte? We wish to differ about Commedia dell'arte, preferring palace comedy. Gilvery also discussed Commedia dell'Eredita, or learned comedy, inspired by and translated from ancient Greco-Latin sources. Eredita was most often written by noble playwrights, noble playwrights, and usually presented in noble settings such as palaces and manor houses. We argue that Shakespeare's comic inspiration was most often erudita, or even directly from Latin and Greek. Why must Stratfordians insist on Commedia dell'arte as Shakespeare's source? Could it be they pretend that low-class dell'arte supported Shakespeare himself as lower class? Could it be they wish to pretend that Shakespeare encountered dell'arte performance on every street corner, even in remote Stratford? Could it be they wish to pretend that Shakespeare wrote his comedies for entertaining common folk in public theaters, not for nobles and palaces? The problems with Dell'Arte, though improvisation, improvisational comedians were used by both Dell'Arte and Eredita, especially for interludes, Dell'Arte was definitely definable only when Scala informed the Gelosi troupe, jealous ones, in the mid 1560s. But Eredita dates back to the earliest 1500s and even earlier, drawing on the greatest poet playwrights. The larger scenarios, not full skits 
but more like interchangeable interludes, were first published in Scala's 1611 book. They were hardly like Shakespeare's dialogue. From 1562 to 1603, France and the Netherlands were in civil war, so the traveling to London, this counts for troops, of course, from Italy was very dangerous without royal protections all the way. Even bigger problems for the Leitor. Comedia de Leitor was intended for roving venues, many languages or dialects making dialogue a drag on the comedic effect. Often dialects were used for ridicule. The Leitor depended on one line as in slapsticks to tell the story, hardly like Shakespeare's rich and complex works. Thus, the Leitor essentially jettisoned dialogue altogether today, seeing Du Soleil, the Marx Brothers character Harpo, and totally silent mimes are good examples. By contrast, Commedia Erudita was created by great writers for noble, ducal, royal, papal patrons. Each play for just one of many Italian dialects and often used Latin as a lingua franca. Erudita used rich, complex dialogue just as Shakespeare's English comedies did. For Erudita, frequently nobles joined in as its actors, if only because they knew Latin well enough to pronounce it. Um, and Kevin Gilvery in uh, Great Oxford phrases it, since the nobility were excluded from the public platforms of theaters and politics, they found consolation in attending the close literary academies, of which there were nearly 700 in northern Italy alone. There they would compare classical manuscripts, suggest new readings and interpretations. Each one of these academies was founded by a powerful and influential man, the original one in Florence being Cosima de' Medici. Now we have a table here, uh, which is also in the article in uh, number 54, of the newsletter, and I, uh, like Ron just did, invite you to look closely at that. There are 12 variables here. I got it right here. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> Go back. Yes. Improvisational, noble, well educated to others. Exit in plaza, street and public venues, often had an Il Dottore character, character, often had Miles Gloriosis character, authors were well known, published poets, authors were often nobles themselves, often had women or girls in female roles, often went off the road in Italy, seasonally traveled abroad, occasionally traveled to England. Over time, dialogues gave way to gibberish. Now you can see from the columns here, the difference between Erudita, Del Arte, and compared to Shakespeare's comedies and, comedies and what's later uh, on Ron's part, the tira, Tirata. Um, Edith Jaffe Berg, uh, in the multilingual art of Commedia Del Arte, in preface, uh, pages 9 to 10, says, uh, well, you can read it yourself, for anyone who is a speaker of more than one language, the consciousness of the potential of languages, limitation and the inevitable existence in between languages is really we rest with daily. Do we think in one language and dream in another? And of course, what uh, is said about multilingualism that uh, only when you dream in the other language as well, you have a, uh, a good sense of the other language. Are we truer in language? Is one language more honest, accurate, or expressive? We secretly imitate another language, not knowing its treasury of words nor its grammar, merely mimicking sounds and rhythms we have heard others utter. You can read it for yourself in Commedia dell'arte, which remains one of the most significant examples of multilingual theater, mask, gestures, and the physicality of language actualized by the voice of the actor, unmediated are the heart of the performance. 
And then I think the most important is the fourth, is the delicate balance of making sense and celebrating linguistic expressivity that sometimes lead to nonsense that is at the root of this book. What does it mean to have a multilingual performance, multilingual or multi-dialect, and how is sense transmitted despite barber-like circumstances? Our conclusions are, if the audience had to be well-educated enough to be multilingual and multicultural, then we can be sure that the nobility was originally the prime audience and often among the performers. Originally, those who wrote Comedia Eredita for the nobility were ideally nobles themselves or courtly retainers to the most powerful rulers. They were the celebrated poets, philosophers and authors. Marsilio Ficino, Pietro Bembo, Ludovico, Ariosto, Niccolo Machiavelli, Baldassare Castaglione, the G.I.'s Infinati, a group of Siena nobles who wrote a deceit, Pietro Aretino, Rosante, Giambattista Guarini, Giambattista della Porta, Giordano Bruno, and more. Even Lorenzo the Magnifico, the Magnificent, wrote Commedia Eredita before he ascended to the ducal throne of Tuscany. Some were courted and feared because a barb in a play ridiculing a prince could cause a prince to lose prestige and power. So who might have aspired to be Il Magnifico of England in 1575? Well, Ron takes over from here. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that Jan is, like most Europeans, multilingual. And I went out of my way to uh, bend his arm in, into cooperating on this because I wanted someone who is truly multilingual to address this multilingual question. <laughs> All right, now, suppose I could give you an example of Commedia Eredita, and suppose it had Oxford as a character in it, and suppose I could date it to within a few months of when it had to have been performed, and suppose I could tell you that one Englishman later would write about seeing Oxford make a challenge to a joust, and then I show you a Commedia Eredita that has Oxford in it in a joust. Well, I think you all know what I'm talking about. So uh, without further ado, oh gosh, did I say crap? Okay, the, the question was so who might have aspired to be Il Magnifico of England in 1575? Well, uh, quite frankly, nobody expected to unless they were to marry the queen. But uh, I think that the question is which queen, all right, of England? Because in 1570, Queen Elizabeth had been excommunicated by one pope, and then in 1573 that excommunication was reaffirmed by the next pope, who then went to some lengths to uh, spell out how it should take place. First of all, Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, was, according to the pope, Queen of England. Secondly, the victor of Lepanto, Don Juan of Austria, was to take the Spanish fleet to England, free Mary, put her on the throne, and marry her. Now, this was a big surprise to Don Juan. It was an even bigger surprise to Philip II. And even more than that, Mary Stuart was already wed. And her husband was rotting away in a jail in Norway of all places. <laughs> so uh, 
what we're looking at here is 1575, the summer of 1575, and the world is has at least fictionally come together in a tremendous crusade against the Turks. In other words, to complete the task that Don Juan had started at the Battle of Lepanto, but had been held back by his jealous bro brother, Philip II, from completing because Philip simply was just terrified of the Spanish fleet sailing up the Aegean to Constantinople and then being sunk and Spain being defenseless. Don Juan had saved Spain two years before Lepanto when he led the suppression of the uh, Morisco Rebellion and uh, committed many war crimes in the process by our standards. But in those days, it was typical that when you took a city, you allowed your troops three, year, three <laughs> days of rampine, as it was called, and uh, you essentially destroyed the city. So that happened to, in Granada, and Don Juan is not well regarded in Granada even today. All right, now, was Oxford on a covert mission during his trip to Italy in 1575 to 76? We heard something about disguises and uh, and, and other things just er earlier this morning. And I think that was really something you need to keep in mind. Oxford was going into the belly of the Catholic beast, so to speak, from a, from a uh, Protestant standpoint. And uh, why was he doing it? Up until now, it's been sort of standard understanding that he was just a tourist. But... I'm going to show you a timeline that has some interesting contrast. I don't have time to read it all. I'll point out a few things and then let you uh, address it at your own leisure later when this gets put up on the web page. Will be put up on the web page, right? <laughs> okay. Now, this, let's start with. Okay, well, I've already covered the Pope. Now, here, January 1573, the slash four means that today we would call it 1574. Okay, so under old dating, it was still 1573. The calendar changed at March 25th. Okay, so before that, you would be in the old year, and at March 25th, it was connected to Lent and uh, the, the Assumption, Assumption Day. In other words, Our Lady's Day. So it's called Lady's Day Dating. All right. Anyway, in January 1573 to 4, Oxford reportedly met with Spanish diplomat spy Antonio de Guerres, a go-between for Mary Stewart and Don Juan. In, in this timeline, DJ is Don Juan. I don't know if he played platters at music halls, but and uh, also a conduit for the Marian, Marianists. Now, the Marianists were sworn to overthrow Elizabeth and put Mary on the uh, throne. And when later in 1581, Oxford uh, betrayed three of his cousins, they were Marianists, or at least he was saying they were. Okay, uh, 1574, in coordination with the Privy Council, and I say this because we all know that Walsingham vouched for, for Oxford, and Walsingham didn't put his life on the line for any man unless he had the backing of half of the Privy Council behind him. And, uh, and I could name probably a half a dozen privy councillors, starting with Burley, Sussex, 
uh, Bacon. That's Bacon's father, Nicholas Bacon, and uh, several others who were likely in favor of what I'm going to describe. Nevertheless, Oxford went all the way to Brussels, Brussels, and he uh, came back. The queen was enraged. You heard that said this morning. But was she really enraged? Or was that for Spanish consumption? Or, and this I think is more probable, was it essential that she be kept out of the loop because to put her in the loop would mean that within minutes she would summon Lester, and Lester was known to be in the Spanish pay. So it's just a question that needs to be addressed. I don't think it's a game stopper in any way. Okay, now, uh, almost as soon as Oxford returns, perhaps on the same ship, from Brussels was sent uh, a representative from the Spanish government. Uh, in fact, someone that you'll hear later in almost every history, and that was Bernardino Mendoza to negotiate a truce with England so that the two countries could combine to attack the Netherlands, actually the Dutch. You're, you're Dutch, right? Okay, so those those piratical Dutch, they were just terrible. Anyway, the point is, is it actually worked. It was a three-year truce from 1574 until 1577. And then at the end of 1577, you had Mendoza return again, this time as ambassador. And he was only there for about a year before Elizabeth kicked him out because he always was a, basically a spy master. So he went to Paris where he spy mastered there as the ambassador, the Spanish ambassador uh, to Paris. And uh, in 1589, while Oxford's brother-in-law was uh, leading troops to invade France and uh, attack Paris, Mendoza literally took over the entire capital city and ran it on behalf of the Catholic League and uh, basically ended up being attacked by everyone. The king allied with Henri de Navarre and they attacked Paris and Paris was being attacked by <laughs> Well, it, it was a real mess, but that was 1589. We're, we're now back in 1574 and 5. I just wanted to mention that because Mendoza was a crony of Don Juan's that had known him since boyhood, had actually betrayed him in one important uh, circumstance. And, and uh, in my opinion, He's a perfect model for Iago, especially since he was a, uh, a leader of the order of Santiago de Compostela. Okay, uh, now, we go to August 1574, very important. Don Juan is in Piacenza, which is a territory ruled by his half-sister, the Duchess of Parma. And uh, she throws a giant tournament in Piacenza, and uh, Don Juan wins it. At the end of the tournament, he's receiving the prize, and in comes messengers and says, your forces in Tunis have just been captured by the Turks. The Turks have rebuilt the army that you destroyed at uh, Lepanto, and they've retaken Tunis from you. So uh, that's an important point. The loss of Tunis 
actually deprived Don Juan of a crown because the, po the Pope had named him King of Tunis when he took it in 1573. And there, there he was bereft of his crown. So uh, he started taking the Pope's order that he proceed to uh, England and become King of England or King Consort of England a little more seriously. For one thing, I believe this is when he began to take English lessons. And by 1578, in private, because he didn't want to appear in public speaking English, he would be speaking flawless English to English emissaries behind the scenes. Okay. I'm going to leave out the discussion of Oxford's wife here because it's not really important to this issue. Now, uh, having traveled to Strasbourg with Burley's spy, uh, William Lewin, who had earlier been Burley's daughter's tutor, Oxford uh, met Sturmius, who was Burley's paymaster for Protestant causes, and Prince Casimir, who, believe it or not, had hired a bunch of German readers or mercenaries and was invading France, headed straight for Paris. Fortunately for the French, they didn't have to worry too much because the readers all took advantage of the grapevines that were along the way and ended up getting sick of green grapes. So <laughs> it was uh, one of the worst invasions impossible. All right, now, I have to keep going. So let's just point out that every step along the way in this timeline, there is sinister politics. And we end up getting to the summer of 1575 when I believe that the uh, tirade of the joust, the Tirata del Giostra, was written. Who wrote it? I have some candidates in mind. Oxford himself, for one, because there are English jokes in it. Also, a Spanish person who was very proud of his Italian was uh, Miguel Cervantes. And you'll see wherever the blue is, MC, Miguel Cervantes. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay, great. Plenty of time. Miguel Cervantes is important here. He had served under Don Juan at Lepanto. He had served in the conquest of Tunis. He had been badly injured at Lepanto, and Don Juan visited him in the hospital. He uh, was reassigned after Tunis was lost to Sardinia. And then in the early summer of 1574, he was reassigned to Palermo, Italy. And at the very time that uh, we believe that, that uh, Oxford, Oxford was seen in Palermo, Don, uh, Miguel Cervantes was there. Now, why would I think that Miguel Cervantes escorted Oxford to Naples? Uh, it could have been anyone. On the other hand, Miguel Cervantes did go to Naples, to Don Juan's headquarters, his palace. He, was, he received letters of introduction from Don Juan, and in early, 15, uh, early September of 1575, he sailed towards uh, Spain on a mission for Don Juan. Unfortunately, he was taken by Al Algerian pirates, enslaved for five years, and his family went bankrupt, raising his uh, ransom. So Cervantes was a very bitter man when he finally returned to Spain, and he turned to uh, uh, satirical writing and poverty. Okay, uh, now, another important point is if Oxford 
did go to Naples, and there's some good evidence that I mention, mention here as to why he did, or that he did. For one thing, he delivered a, a letter to an Italian uh, um, in who was then in Naples. And uh, so anyway, another reason why I suspect that Oxford left Naples in, 15, in September of 1575 is that Don Juan was ordered by Philip II to take a fleet of 40 uh, galleys, most of them Venetian actually, up to Genoa where there was a civil war raging between uh, the new nobles who were backed by the uh, Huguenots of France and the old nobles who were the ones that lent Philip II of fortune. And Philip was interested in getting the old nobles back into power. So Don Juan took this 40 galleys up there, fired a bunch of cannons, and the next thing you know, the new nobles were fleeing for their lives. The old nobles got in power and forgave Philip II all of his debts. Okay? And it was, I think, <clears throat> it was the, either the second or third of his four bankruptcies during his entire reign. <clears throat> All right, so Oxford returned to Venice from Genoa, having hurt his knee in a Venetian galley in, on September 23rd, 1575. <clears throat> and it's just so happened that about that same time, Two Polish men who were despised by Henri III uh, were murdered in Padua by Englishmen. Now, Henri had been king of Poland, which back then elected their kings, and he was elected king of Poland, but uh, he preferred to be king of France, and when his brother died, he went sort of the long way back to France through Venice. <clears throat> uh, is that 10 minutes all together? Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap up very quickly here. Let's go to the Tirada. We believe that this is a response to Oxford's Palermo challenge. Here's an example of a translation that was done in 2008. That's uh, three years after I, uh, my team did our translation. Uh, you'll notice that, uh, ah, there you go. There's Elmon, the Lord to Oxford, right there. And uh, you have Alvida, Countess of Edinburgh, and of course Mary Stuart had re reigned from Edinburgh. Then you have... Uh, down here you have Ernie Linda, Tsarina of Muscovy. Excellent reason to believe that she was, in fact, a stand-in or a, a lampoon of Queen Elizabeth. <coughs> <coughs> Queen Elizabeth had been wooed by Ivan the Terrible, uh, who had sent one deposition, or I mean one uh, uh, mission after another to try to get her to accept his proposals of marriage. And uh, this, this took place in 1575, remember. Just two years before, in 1573, Ivan had actually, uh, just within a four-month period, had wed and murdered three of his Tsarinas. Okay, so you can guess what the final result for Ernie Lena was intended to be. <clears throat> this right here is the ending, and I point this out right here. Uh, all along the way, almost every line, leads until you get to here, the Cotticelli translation ignores any subtext. It just goes for the straight, uh, probable kind of solution. And the problem is, is the text is just full of 
contractions and and cutoffs and uh, uh, and uh, abbreviations and lore and myth and so on and so forth, and so that you you can pretty much write a totally separate dialogue based on what I call the sinister subtext, the left-handed subtext. <clears throat> now, here's an example of an English joke among the gifts. You have Coticelli's translation saying, to our filio, the column of Manlius Torquatus. Now, Manlius Torquatus was a historical Roman who was principally famous for executing his son for disobedience. Uh, the sinister translation, based on alternative words for any contractions and such that were in there, is uh, the cologne or perfume of manly twisting and turning, that is, the sweat of, con of a contortionist. Now, the word manly doesn't exist in uh, Italian. It is, however, an English word. Okay? So, here's a joke that makes sense in English, but not in Italian. And it's in an Italian script. Then there's a heroic gift to Oxford, the horn of Astolphus. It was a horn that destroyed the enemies. And uh, this, I believe, symbolized Oxford becoming Don Juan's agent in England. And uh, in other words, Oxford was assigned to delude Don Juan. <clears throat> Here's a not so bad gift for Mary Stuart. And basically what this is, is Zenobia rebelled against Rome. Her young son was named King of the East. And when they were destroyed, their armies were destroyed, she lucked out in being coming the wife of a Roman senator, but her son disappeared from history. And I believe that this was the intended future for James I of Scotland. And finally, the truly terrible gift to Queen Elizabeth you have the enchanted wand of Medea. Now, Medea was a sorceress who's most famous for having been miffed at her husband playing around with other women. So she uh, murdered her three sons and herself. And uh, I've just mentioned about Ivan the Terrible. Surely Queen Elizabeth was intended to be shipped off to Moscow to Ivan's wonderful embrace. And another implication is this. She was a virgin only because she murdered her children. And then there are the mottos. These are the autumn items in... Oxford's motto, and notice that it comes from, it's ascribed a, a to Terence. I haven't been able to find it in Terence or anywhere, actually. So it's actually made up and said to be coming from Terence. And I say that we should compare this to uh, the various other linkages between Shakespeare and Terence, and also compare the, the broadsword the color of violet, the emblem of a falcon, with the uh, march of Oxford's retainers on his first entry into London. And finally, we'll ask for questions, but what you're looking at here is two hapless uh, warriors who have are fighting up to the death because they've been bewitched by the evil sorceress Angelica and she's galloping off to those 
bewitch some more victims. Okay, are there questions? <coughs> Boy, speechless. <coughs> Hi, Ron. Um, do, do you believe that the this joust really happened, or and and was Alvida a real person, or well, first that, it of all, wasn't clear from your talk. Keep in mind that this is Commedia Eredita, okay, and it's being recited by Il Dottori. He's essentially doing it from memory, and he's going on probably took an hour to give this performance. And I believe there was a three-level stage. You had down here the audience, and they would come parading up from the audience. They would go up a ramp. They would be at the second level. That's where the jousting would take place. And then there was a third level, the imperial level, where, the, where I believe Don Juan portrayed the emperor of Trebizond, and then all the other supposed honored guests. So, yes, I believe it was a Commedia dell'arte palatial performance, and in response to, to uh, Oxford's challenge from, uh, from Palermo. Any others? Oh, well, it, actually, we have to go back to the timeline for that, but... Uh, <clears throat> One of the more important ones, there was a, a, an Italian in Venice named Lippomano who was then in, in Naples, and Oxford was asked to deliver a letter to it. That's a, that's a fact of history. Secondly, he bragged in 1581, or he was accused of bragging in 1581 of having received bribes from Philip II, Don Juan, and the Pope in Naples. He even specified an amount, some tens of thousands of crowns. Well, we don't know that either. Uh, it's he's he set out saying I'm going to see the rest of Italy. Ends up in Siena, and Siena is only a little bit north of Rome. So anyway, it's. It's questionable whether he actually made it to Rome or not. I believe he did. Isn't it true that uh, Oxford, whilst in Sicily, in Palermo, on his behalf and his queen, issued a challenge to the world that uh, challenging anyone to fight him in a joust? Well, and that, that was that's what authentic, that's but what, nobody responded. Well, no, this is the response. And that's what I've been saying. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you.